go ahead and talk a little bit about leadership. We're doing this in a different format that is giving us what looks like a bit of a headache at the moment um, with our video feed. But what we've done, what we decided to do was send you the presentation separately, and it is available for download as well, and then talk you through it uh, so that we would have the opportunity to have more of a conversation than a presentation. So as we started the project, we thought a lot about what is leadership. And there's a couple of humorous slides at the beginning of your presentation that specifically are about leadership. There's a Merriam-Webster dictionary definition, which is somewhat I don't know, Sue, would you say not particularly useful in defining leadership? I would say totally not useful. Thank you. <laughs> um, the Dilbert cartoon, I always like to go to our management guru when we can. But Supreme Leadership Boards nominating hereditary successors only works in a few standalone monarchies. Uh, they don't particularly do well in nonprofit leadership or in the corporate world. Um, and thus the big red circle that we put in place over that. The Peter Drucker quote that uh, you'll see on your presentation and hopefully behind us soon is that one does not manage people. The task is to lead people. And the goal is to make productive the specific strengths and the knowledge of every individual. That is our goal in leadership development, um, both through the Leadership Development Center of Excellence and through the National Risk Mitigation Center. We have a tremendous amount of talent in our field what we don't always know how to do is develop it in an intentional and an objective way. So, anything you'd like to add to that as we get ready to jump in? No, I think that kind of sets us up well for today, Lil. Thanks. So why would you want to develop internal leadership? What is, what is the point of, of thinking about doing this inside? It's not a facetious question because I really do want to explore this a little bit as we launch into this. Well, I see it kind of twofold. One of them is to develop the agency's capacity to be able to respond to our mission in, in addressing people in poverty and the conditions of poverty in our community. And the other one is to be able to work with individuals in our community to develop more as people. We put those together and we have a higher functioning agency who's able to produce more and do more to address our mission. So I think that's why we do it. And you know, whenever I think about something, I think about why. I'm not going to do it unless it makes sense to me. So I think what, as you think about it, thinking about why, why would we even take on such an initiative? And I think, as we just said, building agency capacity and employee capacity is a real benefit. Um, and it gives you an opportunity as we walk through the steps today. We're going to talk about ways to assess the, the um, the staff capacity that you have, and you can learn about some people that were maybe sleepers in your organization that have huge potential. So this will help you to be able to really tap that intellectual capital that you have in your organization, while at the same time helping the employees that you have to work on their professional development, which gets them excited, and it is really a morale booster, being able to um, work on your personal development and be challenged is a morale booster. And again, that is good for everybody in the organization and the organization. And it also puts you in a position to really be able to respond to the changing environment. Our environment is, as you know, with community action under fire, it's always changing. So this positions you to be able to take that on. It does indeed. And the idea is that we have, as you mentioned, I think, a culture in community action that while it benefits strongly from bringing people in, they also need to be have the values of our network shared with them, the history of our network. And who better to do that than people who have come up from within the field and those who are already with us to develop those strengths and talents. Because if we feel, and I think we all do, um, passionate about the work we do, because heaven knows we're not in it for the retirement benefits or the magnificent right. pay structure. But if we're in it because we believe in this work, then it's important for sustainability that we bring those along with us who are able to do that. We talk sometimes about knowledge management in community action and in and across nonprofits. It's become kind of a buzzword. And we think of it here very simply as extracting the accumulated wisdom of our leaders and the network and finding ways to transfer the knowledge, the wisdom, the contact to our emerging leaders and looking for ways to do that. And this is precisely, I think, what we're talking about here. That is precisely it. 
so as we think about doing this, there are some pieces of this that are called, we think of them as a checklist, a leadership development checklist. As you're getting started doing this, there are six discrete steps that we're going to talk through a little bit in today's webinar on um, how to put that together. That's right. So the first one I think that is so key is to get the support of the executive director and the support of the, the board of directors. Without this buy-in and, and um, commitment to resources, it's not going to happen. So if there's somebody behind it championing, championing it, it's going to move forward and happen. And the resources that we're talking about here are some money, but a lot of it is time. And we're going to give you some techniques on, um, and, and tools to be able to do this kind of work without a huge amount of outlay of money. But there is a lot of time involved as you're training and developing people. And so one of the things that we're going to start by doing is looking at who do you presently have on staff and what are the, the president, uh, present work needs and, and people needs, and then in the future. What you have today, as we know community action is changing by the minute, might not be the needs that are there for tomorrow. So you have to be uh, positioned and ready to go with that. And, and in doing this, we're talking about a succession planning initiative where uh, we're following through with our plans and then developing our leaders as we've just talked about. Uh, and then having to keep on top of it and you know, just doing it and then never checking to see if it's working isn't going to be effective either. <laughs> no. no, we all know what happens when it's, and when it's nobody's job, nothing gets done. So one of the decisions you have to make is where to seat this in, in your agency. So the first step we're going to talk through just for a minute or two is about committing to a leadership development program. Um, really, there are some philosophical principles. There's thinking about purpose and goals. Okay, there you go, perfect. So what I would encourage is that, you know, as you sit down and you think about this, you have your buy-in and you're talking with your board, what is the mission? What do you really see as the mission? What do you want for your agency? And coming up with a mission statement of this is really what we're after. And from that, just like when you do your strategic plan, your mission and what your needs are are then going to help you develop your future direction. So I think that that's the first step is to, you know, commit and to, you know, start to think about this is how we want to do it and where we want to be. Absolutely. The next steps then are going to be to develop that action plan. That's right. Once you've discussed what you're hoping for and what the goals of the program will be, uh, i.e., do we believe philosophically that the majority of our agency leaders should be developed internally, or certainly within the network, even if not within our agency. And that's true for the majority of agencies that we've worked with in Pathways. It's certainly true of the agency um, that I have been in. And a shout out today to Doug Rocky, who was signed up, uh, because I'm going to use us as an example, Doug, of how development plans change and how when you support employees in growth, occasionally they wander off to the partnership uh, instead of staying put. <laughs> but that's about leadership development, too. Right. Um, so as we go through this, um, each step, please bear in mind, we're not going to repeat this ad nauseum, each thing that we're talking about is laid out in this kit. There's a guide that's going to be about 20, 25 pages in final layup on the philosophical questions, how to use the kit. But then we have literally attachments A through, I think, P or Q, that is each and every form that you're going to see excerpted in the, in the slides that are now running and that you're going to um, be able to use in any way that suits you, i.e., these are for you to develop your action plan, your individual development plan, your keys to success are really about basing within your agency's philosophy and mission. That's right. So as we talk about the action plan, um, the goals and desired results, what kind of things would you, would you offer to the network as we think about that? Um, I think that you know, every, if, unless it's written, it often doesn't happen. And I always say, you know, what we focus on becomes our reality. So you're going to have, you know, what actions need to be taken as you start thinking about it and you have to start figuring out how are we going to um, assess people? How are we going to do this? How are we going to do that? Who's going to pay for this? How is this going to happen? So it's really going through step by step and figuring out what you need to do to get this off the ground and putting that in writing and who's responsible. Otherwise, it's easy to fall through the cracks, as we all know. So that's our first step. And then sustainability of the program is key. Um, 
where is it going to be? Are you going to house this somewhere? Because and we talk about this a lot, actually, in our excellence programs, as well as in our leadership programming and in our tools, is that really, if it's not, as I said, not someone's job, it's just not anyone's job, right. but you need to set up a formal structure that doesn't have to be fancy or complicated. It can be very simple and straightforward, but how are you going to track this? So the sustainability questions are key. And I think one of, you know, questions is where does it go? Often it's HR could take it on, or, you know, some agencies are smaller, and there's not a full HR capacity. And so small, you know, groups of folks take it on and oversee that together. So there's, again, no right or wrong here, but there's just different ways to think about it and what works for your agency. Uh, I think that uh, who's you know going to have that oversight? Make sure that it keeps running. The you know ED and the board should be getting regular reports on how that's working, and that you know are there going to be incentives for staff who choose to participate? It may take some extra time of theirs. They might have to maybe do a little bit of double jobs depending on how it's all you know their individual development plan. So thinking about all of those things and then. How are you going to keep track of this? I mean, this is a human resource piece, and that we know that that's really important to keep uh, track of in, in different ways that we'll talk about today, but also in your human resources. So as we think about doing this, um, there are some other steps in determining what the agency needs. Yes. And the way that we like to think about this, as we've worked with Sue and David in developing this kit, is we know that none of us can do it all at the same time. Depending on the size of your leadership team, you're going to have to choose where you want to start with this. So one of the things that we ask you to do as you begin this process is to really look at your present and future work and people needs. So we can talk a little bit about the present needs and how, how the tools that we have to help people assess this. Right. Um, so, you know, you're going to be looking at different positions and, and um, assessing what would happen if that person wasn't there. Um, if, you know, if they retired or, you know, are there some people strong in one part and not in another part? And then when you're looking at your future um, needs, you're thinking about where are we going strategically? You know, right now we just did a new strategic plan and we're going to start um, working on housing. We've seen that in our community needs assessment that said that was a real priority in our, in our community. So do we have anybody with housing expertise? So you're starting to think about, okay, where are we going to be going and what are the skills and people we need to be able to do that? So as you look at your current needs, as we, take yes. it, we bite off the first piece of that because we know so much more typically about where we are now than perhaps right. about where we may be going. Right. You're going to want to look and you're going to want to do this for each member of two groups of people. One is your formal leadership and management team. Mm -hmm. You're going to want to determine the development needs. Uh, there. You're looking at a slide that should say position, title, and incumbent on the top, on the screen. You also, however, don't want to limit yourself, and Sue and I were discussing this a little bit earlier today, to just your formally named leadership team. That's Often right. in an agency, there are a couple of folks with key skills to your success who may or may not, in fact, be formally designated as part of the leadership team. That's right. I said one of the key people often when I go into agencies is that's vital is the administrator or the executive secretary to the executive director. And when those people are gone, nobody, you know, can function. You know, the, how do you get the board packets out? How do you contact people? They're key, key people. And so that's a, a one position to think about. Another one might be um, IT, you know, without having those skills and things fall apart, or MIS. You know, some people are, it's very limited to who knows that in an agency. So those are all things to consider when you're looking at who, who do we need to um, do a risk assessment on. As you go through this particular form, and this is only page one of it, we're not showing you all the whole of each and every form. This particular position, so let's say we're going to deal with your Head Start director, okay, hypothetically. So you'd look at the functions of that office. If there's a good job description already in place, that's a good place to start. Mm -hmm. What are their actual day-to-day -day responsibilities? Mm -hmm. And then commensurately, what are their authorities? That's right. Um, what do they have to uh, do with strategic objectives? And generally, programs like that are, are key. Right. And you'll note the bottom line of this part of this form, which is then you, based on looking at their function, responsibility, authority, and how involved they are, is their position impact high, medium, or low? In a community action agency, as lean as we all are in these lean right. times, 
we don't expect you're going to find too many where it's low. That's right. But a lot of mediums and probably a few highs. And we don't have a measurement scale for you. This is for you to just think about this and look at how that works. Now, once you've actually looked at the functional responsibilities of the position, it's time to take a look at the person. That's right. Please go right ahead. Please. So there's many different things to consider when you're looking at people. You know, one of the things I see when I go out into the network is that we're all aging. Um, that there's, you know, a lot of folks who started community action when they were young folks, and now we're thinking about retirement. And so one of the things, considerations that's very important is the retirement eligibility. How many people do you have there? Marketability. Now, um, uh, Lil and I had two different thoughts about this. Lil is saying they're so marketable somebody's going to come and scoop them up, which is a real uh, possibility. And I had been thinking about, you know, it could be a very difficult position to fill. So considering those two, you know, what would happen if that person wasn't there? You know, life events. Again, I'm, I'm using the baby boomers, but this could be anybody where, you know, things happen at home. We have to take care of a loved one for whatever reason, and suddenly we're not available. And we might know that there's aging parents in an issue, and so that's something to consider. And then, again, the involvement of the strategic objectives. You're, you know, what is, what is your strategic plan? How involved is that person in this? Are there key grants they're administering, and with them not being there, would other people be able to do that? So once you think about the person aspect of it, again, looking at what is our risk? Is it high that this person would leave, medium, or low? And these are obviously questions that you as a director or as you're drilling down through your leadership team and your key position team as they look at their next level of staff, these are questions that you have in your own head. We've had the question raised as we field tested some of the items in this kit that you know you can't be looking at people by whose retirement eligible in mm -hmm. the sense of liability for removing them from office. I want to be very, very right. clear that's not what we're talking right. about here. We're talking about, as a director, your assessment of how high is your vacancy risk because you're going to use that assessment to go on to the next step, which is to decide where to invest your time, energy, and or other resources first to deepen your bench strength. Those areas where your vacancy risk is high, you're going to want to attack first. It's not that you're trying to move someone out or keep someone who wants to go or anything along those lines. Right. It's simply to be ready for unexpected events. And I'll turn it around. You know, as you know, I'm a millennial, but Cashin, for instance, here is a, is a Gen Y. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm Gen X. I beg your pardon. I'm confusing my generation. Right. Gen Y or millennial. We all have those challenges. I have children in college, which at any point things can happen. Other people get married and want to start families. These are the kinds of life events we're talking about, and they're not used to move people out or to make decisions about promotion. We need to be very, very clear. This is just to look at when you might have a temporary vacancy, because this is all about both short-term and long-term gaps and developing that bench so that you can survive a two-week vacation, a three-month medical or family leave, or a long-term um, departure of someone who's got to go care for someone in another state, for instance. So important to think about it in that context. So here's one chart that we developed to look at if you actually start tracking the oh, um, the leadership development needs. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the kinds of eyebrow raising that go on when you break it out this way. Well, what I did was I looked at current on board, and that was the leadership, management, mid-managers, other su supervisors, and I came up with 34 people. So then I looked at, okay, who's eligible to retire now, and just considering that factor, which was six, and then I added in, you know, who's eligible to retire in the next few years, and I got ten more. So almost 50% of this staff is eligible to retire. Again, we're, nobody's pushing them out. They may choose not to, which is great. We have an incredible um, rich history with that person, but there's... 50% of your key positions could turn over. So that's something that might help you um, to kind of exacerbate the need to move this along, <laughs> or would me, keep me up at night maybe too. Well, and, and it's a worry because this is a challenge that's facing uh, corporate America. Mm -hmm. I mean, and we like to say we're all in business. Our bottom line is simply not based on dollar profit. Our profit right. is to change lives of the communities and families we serve. Right. You know, Exxon has a little bit different bottom line. But at the same time, we all care about the future and moving it forward. 
So if, again, if we care enough about the work we're doing to be doing it well, we need to be mindful about the sustainability of that work, which involves bringing up new leaders all the time. That's right. So here is um, a, a chart and a, a form that we've developed in the kit, which is assessing your bench strengths by position. So if you've gone through your leadership team and your other key, ta key kind of skill set folks, mm -hmm. and now for each position, <laughs> what we'd like you to do as you do this is fill out this form. And which is to say, for the, again, in our example, director of Head Start, okay, simple box. How many are ready now? How many with development could be ready in one, two, or three to five years? And feel free to change the timelines. This is, again, what we think of as a reasonable frame for developing people. Um, and then your action plan will come out after you look at all your leadership and key staff and decide if you have no one ready now, in certain key positions, that's where you want to start the rest of the steps we're going to outline. If right. you've got someone in each position, you can do a broader first stroke on who you want to involve. But we strongly recommend that you use these tools to assess where those vacancies might occur mm -hmm. and develop that bench strength there first and then use mm -hmm. that to start the program to develop leadership across the rest of your agency. Have I summed that up? Absolutely. Well? We have to start somewhere. It's very overwhelming to think that you're going to take on everybody at once. But there's keys to start with, so that's great. Yeah, so you've identified your top, let's just say for the purposes of today, three folks who mm -hmm. you're going to engage because you've got no backup for them. And now that we've frightened you sufficiently by how much, how soon they could leave, we are thinking in terms of, of moving people up to help back them up. Because realistically, and we have used this example, of the, I think there's 80 or so folks on our webinar today, and thank you all for attending. How many of you have ever been able to take a two-week vacation without being either terrified of what's going to happen at work, or you take a shorter one because you simply can't be gone that long? I would posit that for all of our continued health and well-being, mental energy and dedication, having this kind of plan in place isn't right. just about vacancies, it's about being able to recharge our own batteries. It's about having the peace of mind to take on new projects, knowing that we have appropriate redundancies in place and leadership ready to step up. That's right. So again, we keep relating it back to that, that bigger picture of why do this in the first place. That's right. So let's talk a little bit. Determining the HR's future leadership needs are a little bit trickier than your present ones, which are so defined. Right. How would you how would you talk to agencies about well, that? Well, what I talk about is you, you go to your strategic plan. Hopefully, you have a vibrant plan that everybody is using and following. And again, you may have some new initiatives in there, but that's where you're going. That's where your needs assessment, your board, everybody is pulled together and said in the next perhaps three to five years, this is where we're going. So with that, you're going to identify what kind of skills do we need. And again, I gave the example of maybe you're going to start a housing program, so you need expertise in that area. And what kind of people do we need to be able to, um, to do such a program? And that's just one among many. There's a lot of other things. Only really your future plans will help. This is probably, murky is the wrong word, but the least specific area of the toolkit. We give you some questions to right. ask and a couple of forms that we hope will be helpful. Right. But each agency's plans are a little different. There's not quite as much room for a boilerplate uh, piece of a kit as there is with that because your hopes, your dreams, your strategic plans, your community's hopes, all play into that. Right. And your grants also. Sometimes you get grants. Obviously, they're going to be in line with your strategic plan and mission, but they may have a uh, specific set of skills that they require. So that's another resource to look at as you're thinking about your future. All right. And we'll move on, and let's actually talk about the succession planning piece and what all that involves. You'll see on your screen a couple of main bullets, and one is succession plan for executive directors, for your CEOs. That is the piece that most people think of when you say succession planning. Right. When people see a workshop, for instance, that's titled that, they think about the ED. The reality is that the ED, well, clearly the most area of risk, you know, to mm -hmm. lose unexpectedly, is not the only area. What we've done to make these kids bite-sized, to make them very user-friendly with forms that, as we like to say with my beloved Apple products, you can use right out of the box. <laughs> um, is we're breaking this into two pieces. Mm -hmm. And we'll address board succession um, next year along with Cap Law, our good partner. And we've done some toolkits with them now, and they have some other individual ones that we highly recommend for board succession. But as we talk about executive directors, we are going to be rolling out a kit in the next month on executive succession planning. 
Sue and David are also partnering with us on that and some of the materials. And our lead contractor on that piece is Transition Guides here that many people in the Community Action Network have used. So we will have that separate piece. We'll do a separate webinar on that and roll it out in much the same way. But today we're going to talk, still talk about program managers, directors, our hypothetical Head Start director. And the succession plans for those folks are one plan but with two components, and that's the short and the long term components. Okay. So why don't we talk a little bit about those? All right, well, let's put some time frames on them. So the first one would be a short term plan, and that would be three months under three, three months or less. So somebody happens to go out unexpectedly, um, but it's just for a short period of time. They need to have surgery, they're going to be back, but what are you going to do in the meantime? And the long-term plan, we're thinking about more than three months. So if this turned into a longer-term issue, uh, what, what kind of things would be in place? And they might be a little bit different. There might be someone who could fill in on a short-term plan, but on the longer term, it's more taxing on the person's position and doing two things at once could be more difficult. So it might be plan B on that. You might need two people, but you'll have to, you know, again, what are the resources within your agency and how you're going to do that. Whatever you decide in your plan, it's so critical to communicate because, you know, if you don't tell people what's going on, they'll make it up. So they might as well get the right information. So as soon as you can, you need to let uh, the, your staff know, the board know, your funders know. That you don't want them to be hearing from other funders, oh, there's been a big change over at the Community Action Agency. What's going on? Well, I don't know. Or something in the paper. So it's important for you to get ahead of that. Information and contact. You want to know, you know, who are their contacts? If I have a grant, who am I supposed to call? And, and you know, if you have somebody who, you know, unexpectedly goes out and, and suddenly you have a question on the grant and you don't know who to call, that's where the, the inventory and the contact um, part is really helpful. And then thinking about uh, what, what hap has to happen for these different grants or responsibilities. Do you have to have quarterly reports done? What, what needs to happen? So really getting on top of that and you're not uh, in that position of, of, you know, being thrown into. I've been in the position of being all of a sudden had to, you know, take over for someone um, who was out unexpectedly and I didn't know what to do. I, I, and I had no one to talk to because that person had been an ace in the hole, knew it all. Also thinking about, especially when it gets longer term, when are their program evaluations supposed to be done? You know, those kind of administrative tasks are really important. Who, who does their budget? Who monitors the budget? What are the grant reporting? You know, how often do they have to report? So the, the nitty-gritty the nitty that they're dealing with day-to-day, -day, you just don't know. So it's those kind of things that are important to have and know. So you can just pick it up and go. The funder doesn't get scared saying, ah, uh, they don't know what's going on. Who's running this show? So it just helps you to get um, prepared and, and ready for anything that may come your way. I couldn't agree more. Having come into jobs, you know, in a couple of times in my career where there wasn't sufficient backup and the person, my predecessor had moved or was relatively unavailable, um, that becomes challenging. Yes. And even looking at the work that we're doing here now at the partnership, we have to be mindful of this. There's so many things going on. There's leadership. There's risk mitigation. There's community economic development. And at any given time, a couple of us need to know those pieces so that we can help with that. That's right. Let's talk about a little bit. We're talking about succession plans, and those are critical. But there is a distinction that we're going to draw as we move forward between succession planning, which is the actual process of thinking about people and positions, and leadership development. Sue? So succession planning, I think, is, is in terms of risk management. I mean, what we've been talking about, if you don't have that information, if you don't know what's going to happen, you're in a risky situation. Whereas succession leadership development is really about cultivating talent. It's building capacity. It's really helping your agency to thrive. So that's, you know, kind of thinking about them, and one leads into the other, um, as we'll be talking about, but that's one way to think about it. So as we look forward to identifying and developing individual talent, and uh, spoiler, this is the fun part, um, the rest of it's work. And while it's very satisfying work, it is the nuts and bolts work of sitting down and thinking about your team, thinking about the who's, the what's, the where's, the when's, the possibilities, the skill sets 
analyzing who might be ready when, and we're going to get into some other tools for that here, but identifying and developing talent. Hold on a second. Did we skip a... Yeah, we got it here. Okay. Next. Go in there. Yeah, there you go. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. So first of all, you have to look at your talent assessment process, which is what we're going to take you through a couple of different ways. I'm going to ask Sue to talk to us about ways to do that. Assessing individuals both with and external to their participation. Right. So there's all different ways to do that. One of them would be a 360 evaluation, which, as you know, is getting input to the people that from the people that that individual is involved with. So they would assess themselves on a set of criteria, as well as funders, partners, um, uh, agency staff, supervisees, mentors, those kind of things. So getting input from a different perspective. Sometimes they're just plain leadership assessments where a person fills that out and, uh, you know, based on their perception of who they are. And then another uh, way to think about it is, and in conjunction with actually supervisors getting down and really looking at the individual um, capacity within the organization. Again, there's no right or wrong here. You know, you may be using something that's great. We're going to talk about one tool, uh, but it, what is important is that you do an assessment of individuals and really get a handle on what capacity you have and what you can really grow and develop, because I just know that there's some gems there waiting to be polished. Absolutely. The first thing we're going to talk about is a supervisor tool. Go ahead and advance. And this is one that a supervisor would use solo, in other words, not in a 360 format. And this is only the first of several pages on this one. And they would use this to really look hard at everybody on their team. And Sue has a few cautionary words about being careful because sometimes high performers move around agencies. So you want to right. be thinking about your whole agency. You want to get out of the silos that people are working right. in programs and move across. So one area, for instance, in this is, and this matches with the 360 review we'll show you here in just a moment, mm -hmm. is the areas and the levels of leadership. That's right. So this is that supervisory assessment. So from the supervisor's point of view, again, not intended to be shared with staff, although you can adapt it for that, is where do you think each member of your team is? Because then what you're going to do is use this to inform a grid of where your performers are. Sue? So what you're going to do is you're going to you're going to do this on Lil, you're going to do this on me, you're going to do this on Cashin, and then you're going to put it all together and get a picture um, of where they're, you're at at your agency. So the next slide shows you the star potential, individual star potential. So when you're looking at this, you see up in the top right corner, you've got somebody who's a high performer and a good leader, and that is your key A-plus talent. They're not in uh, AAA ball. They are on your bench in the dugout. Um, you've got your B players. They might still be on the dugout, in the dugout, but, you know, they need some work. They need a lot of work from the coaches. And then you've got some dead weight. Now, my guess is if you've got dead weight on the ball team, they're probably not going to be there, or they might be in A-ball, and they've got to work their way up. So as you're sitting, you know, in your agency, you're really looking at, you know, is this person contributing, or how are they contributing? How can we move them up, or is this the right place for them to be? So this can be a really, really nice visual for you to have to kind of, you know, say, okay, here, here's where we're at, and this is where we need to go, need uh, to develop and grow. And it, you know, if you have somebody who's got really, really good leadership skills and just needs some help on developing job skills, that's the easy part. Lil and I had a conversation about leadership skills are harder to develop. They are, but job skills you can teach. They are, and leadership, you know, we always like to to say, I think we as a culture yes. can be taught, and it can be learned. There's yes, no it question can. that it can be learned. But there typically seems to be sort of an internal orientation, if you will, yeah. toward leadership that makes it easier to coach performance behaviors than right. to coach leadership right. behaviors. It's not that it can't be done, it's that it sometimes is harder. A special note on this form, and this is going all the way back to having the right people on the bus, you know, the famous management uh, phrase, which is, a, your form that you have, this does not have these labels on it, so, you know, we've taken off the A+, plus. that's for you to know and to filter people in. But in this day and age of tighter and tighter resources and higher and higher expectations of us, in community action especially, but across the board in nonprofits, is if you've got someone who consistently does not meet expectations in either leadership or performance and does not respond to coaching, it's time to find a different bus. 
Um, and that can be very hard to do, and it can be emotional. But we don't have room anymore to not pull every, for everyone to be pulling their weight for performance. But those B players I wanted to speak to before we move on on this, and you're always going to have some people who are very content yes. to be right there. They absolutely meet expectations. They aren't all that interested in developing further. And we'll talk a little bit about the end and, you know, when you run into snags with coaching people, you know, some thoughts that we have for you on that. But sometimes it's as simple as somebody really doesn't want to move into a greater right. leadership or performance role. And that's okay. Mm -hmm. But it's important that you recognize that. Right. Don't frustrate yourself and them by trying to move them along when they don't want to be. Right. At perhaps the expense of not helping someone along who wants to be. So I think those are the takeaways I'd like to give you on this. Great. So as we go on to the next slide, looking at identifying and developing individual talent, Sue? So we talked about the risk analysis earlier. So looking at that, you know, getting a priority of what positions do we need to develop now. It looked like maybe the Head Start manager we needed to get developing quickly because mm -hmm. we didn't have anybody um, following up, and we know that that's a key, key, key position. So that's your first thing is identifying who are the priorities to develop, where is your biggest risk, and that's the succession planning, remember our risk mitigation. And from that, you're going to start working with the individual and developing plans. You're going to do an assessment that we're going to get into and then developing plans to help them to reach that individual potential and to become better contributors to your agency and helping you meet your goals. So this is what is called the Levels of Leadership Assessment, and this is the one that is very much designed for 360-degree use. It can be used for just a single person to evaluate themselves, but the real value of this comes from matching our perceptions of ourselves to those of others. Ideally, it's two to four people. In these seven focus, six, I beg your pardon, six focus areas, and the kit goes in-depth into each one, and since we only have an hour with you today plus another 15 minutes for a question and answer, we're not going to delve into each one today, although we might, if demand warranted, do a separate uh, webinar looking at that because it's a fascinating field, and there are very clear things that you can do to help people develop in each of these areas. Those are part of, are part of this kit. But as we go forward in that, um, looking at colleagues' evaluations. So you want to talk a little bit to that before we get into a couple of examples? Sure. Um, you know, I've used this a lot with nonprofit agencies all over, and it's really, really effective with the middle management kind of folks, um, but anybody. But that's really where it's um, directed at. And it's, you know, getting input from the supervisor, from ED, from peers, from mentors um, to get the feedback. And part of what, you know, is so important to help people grow is to get really good, you know, feedback to give them, help them identify where they need to move and grow. And so this is a really nice tool to be able to do that. And it's broken down, has all kinds of different questions in each of those areas that Lil um, talked about just a minute ago. So uh, you can, you know, go back to those questions and really see where the person could build and develop. And we'll get into that um, now when we look at um, Polywog. Let's take a look. What would, um, as I look at Polywog, I have questions about the differences. Can you talk to me a little bit about that? Well, what I see when I look at Polywog is that Polywog sees herself differently than her peer, the people that she's working for, that are, than the executive directors, mentors, or whomever. So she finds herself as, you know, a visionary, and she sees herself as a team builder, but those around her don't. So I think it's really worth going back to those questions and helping to explore with Polywog. What's our difference here? What, what is the perception difference? And again, you know, I would say to people, feedback isn't positive or negative. It's what you make it. And this is just helpful. So if Polywog thinks she's doing this strong and the feedback is she could be doing this in a different way or it isn't as strong as she anticipates, that's a great learning opportunity. So this is really a, about learning and developing and helping people to see who they are and how they can develop. I mean, if everybody just keeps saying, oh, yeah, you're doing a good job, you're doing a good job. But this is, you know, it's totally anonymous, so they don't know uh, who said what, but you can really pinpoint what's going on and what you can work and develop on, which can then translate into your goals, which, which we'll get into. Um, a quick word about the mechanics of that, because we're not going to go into them in depth and show you today, is we have courtesy of David Tucker, I believe, yes. and then everyone's tested, and we've gone through and tested and, and uh, 
and worked a few explanations in where we had questions, is we actually have a set of instructions and a template for SurveyMonkey uh, to use uh, this tool so that the polywog in this case can do her assessment and then her reviewers are sent email links so that only the person administering the program sees where the data comes from and ideally then you have one person who's administering who holds probably lots of confidential right. information. And then you can generate these kind of graphs. So as Sue said, that's how you keep it anonymous so that people really feel like they can be, right. be truthful and not worry about being hurtful. Right. You know, and we, we say this all the time in conferences when we're looking for session evaluations. And bear it in mind as you do our pop-up evaluation at the end of this, the difference between praise and feedback is in how you use it. Mm -hmm. Pri praise may make you feel good, but it doesn't help you improve. And mm -hmm. those who are looking for serious improvement really want and need feedback. Mm -hmm. In addition to which, there's of course the old HR thing. If you tell someone they're doing a good job forever and then one day suddenly you tell them they're not, <laughs> you, you, you've acquired a little bit of a problem. <laughs> Let's look at the other end of the scale from Polly Wong. Let's okay. look at Billy Boy. So here is, Billy Boy is, is someone who thinks that he is not as strong a visionary as he'd like. He's hard on himself. But his, the people he works with and who are evaluating him think he's doing a great job. So in Billy Bo Boy's uh, situation, you're going to help him to kind of step up to that leadership role, feel good about what he's doing and his capacity as a leader and not kind of feel like I'm not doing a good job because he is. And here's um, a way to do that. So the thing, he might be working on more of a softer skill about, you know, taking on the leadership role and feeling more confident in his role as a leader because this is showing to me that he's got a, he's got a lot of the skills. He just needs to feel more comfortable in being a leader. So some ways to develop your bench. Again, these are in the kit, but we want to spend a little bit of time on these today. Some things you can think about as you're moving forward. And you'll note that very few of these come with hard dollar costs attached. As with most of the excellence practices in community action, the answers and the strengths we need often lay within our own agency and certainly within our network. Absolutely. And we could find ways to, to help people uh, increase their skill and right. talent, develop their talent rather, without necessarily sending right. them out for classes. Let's talk a little bit about that. Well, first thing we know, if we go to adult learning theory, I won't be a professor right now, but uh, what we know is that adult learners learn by doing. So sending them off to a class is maybe not, depending if whether they need a technical skill or not, but that's usually not the most effective. I used to get the Fred Pryor seminars and send people off, and then they'd come back and, and things would just, you know, not change. So giving somebody a stretch assignment, so the board needs something looked at, or the, the executive director is thinking they'd really like to explore this as an option or that, or we need somebody to take this on. There may be the perfect person that you have identified that would be, it'd be a wonderful thing for them to do. One time I was given the task of doing a program evaluation in my um, organization, and it was so fun. I loved it, and I learned so much about program evaluation that I could then share. It helped me as a leader. It helped the agency because then they had that the knowledge of what the, the evaluation of the program was. So it's right there. You've got people in your organization who are great coaches who can sit down and give someone feedback. Um, there's, you know, there's the formal learning kind of thing, which again, I, I think is sometimes you're going to need that, especially group, internal group kind of meetings. I've done leadership development with organizations where they met once a month and they had readings to work on and improving their leadership skills and they would answer hard questions and they would sit down with their development plans and go over that. So internal support and, and help. And again, that it takes time, but it doesn't take money to be able to do that. Another thing is, you know, again, you've got some real strong leaders in your organization. You've got an ED who's going out into the community, who's meeting with other partners, key people, is meeting with, um, you know, your board. It's got wonderful depth and rich on it. And so you're, um, you can send somebody out with those people to just be like a sponge and take all that information in. I mean, it's just an incredible learning opportunity for them that they wouldn't normally get exposed to. Again, it takes time from their job, but it doesn't cost any money to do that. And there's also time for the whoever's going with that person to give some mentoring and talk about what they're doing and giving them some feedback. So 
it's, it's just it's an incredible opportunity. Um, you know, increasing the responsibility just a little bit. You know, add them, have them take on something. Don't you know? We're not looking to overwhelm people and throw them, but you know, weight them down. But what we are talking about is you know might be able to perk up just a little bit. You know, uh, more responsibility and have them feel good about it. And you know, all these things that we're talking about you know, benefits the individual, but your agency and the morale, it's just the, you know, unintended consequence perhaps of this is, you know, a healthier, innovative agency. It is. Now, there are circumstances, and we're not saying there aren't, so it's on the list, external education. Oh. There is always oh. a time and place. <laughs> right. Absolutely. And we talked about this, too, because we're both fairly passionate that a lot of your leadership and sort of stretch assignments are internal. Yes. But we are not suggesting that people don't need weatherization certification. Absolutely. And that they don't need to have right. everything from CPR training to advanced degrees in some cases. That's right. Um, but there's a time and a place, and to be very intentional about how we do it, rather than just saying, well, we train people as we have money available right. until the training budget runs out. And that's really common in our network. And it's not that people don't care. It's that it's hard to be intentional about this without a framework. That's right. Because you're trying to create the wheel from some rocks and chisels. That's right. As opposed to having a place to start, which is all we're attempting to give you is that place to start, right. thinking about that. And maybe a more strategic way to look at developing people rather than just eyeballing staff and picking out those performers who always stand out from the herd. That's right. Um, sometimes, unfortunately, there are star performers who don't stand out because they're shy or they're star potential is in an area that doesn't uh, come across verbally mm -hmm. or in group. Mm -hmm. This is a way to make sure that you're identifying all your potential stars, because heaven knows both you and the network need them That's right. at all levels. So as you think about the, the costs, which typically are those precious few training dollars, mm -hmm. especially with, with cuts facing us across almost every program, mm -hmm. um, be, do be mindful that we're not saying there's not a place for that, but that you can spend energy, which we know is also a scarce right. resource. Right. So you can spend energy on, on 1 through 9 while acknowledging that 10 here has its place in a very structured way. Right. And let's talk uh, just a little bit about that, about individual development plans. So, you know, based on the needs um, that you've developed from the levels of leadership, if you, you know, that particular tool, but it could be any tool, you're going to see where somebody um, has areas to develop. You're going to look at what kind of positions are we thinking about for this individual. And I'm saying positions, and I want to go back to what something Lil said earlier is that, you know, often we think about, okay, I'm going to develop Lil to be the head start director, but you know what? The director of um, the housing program, we have a new one, and Lil would be the perfect person for that. So this is really about building the agency capacity, not specifically one different program. There'll be other people who could go into that. So that having to have that flexibility around that. But everybody would have an individual development plan. And that's sitting down and looking at what are the needs that have been identified and how am I going to address them? You know, what are the goals? What are the resources that need to be, you know, objectives first um, that I need to work on to be able to do that? So coming up with your action plan on an individual level, we've already talked about the agency level and getting it all moving, and then it's individual level. And then that's kind of, in some ways, it's a contrast between the employee and the organization of, you know, you're going to support me to be able to do this, and I'm going to give my commitment to, to follow through and to okay. learn and do the best I can do. Mm -hmm. And in the individual development plan, and I'm sure it will surprise no one online with us today to hear that, yes, we have a tool for that. Um, <laughs> there's room for that and for that accountability and how you look at it. So let's move on to that, and let's take a look. Again, this is our suggestion of how this might look for your agency. There's a couple of things that we're asking folks uh, to leave in if they can, if they choose to adopt this model, because we'd like to start getting a feel for how this works across the network. We're going to be very, very interested in your feedback from the field right. on putting this kit into place, because we can amend it on the fly to include great new examples of things, to showcase innovative ways to do this that perhaps aren't going to be discovered until people jump into this with those feet and call us up and say, you know, this really belongs here and we think you're missing a piece right. here, we'll be very, very happy to hear that. But so here on the individual development plan, it's very straightforward. Uh, goals, short and long term. If you're doing this uh, as in a leadership development program, it becomes that document between 
your staff, and your agency, mm -hmm. and that two-way commitment, as you mentioned, so those goals have to be mutually agreed. Now, as a side note, there's nothing to stop current leaders from having their own individual development plans. I have a very tattered, dog-eared one of my own that I keep moving up deadlines on, but I still have personal professional goals mm -hmm. that aren't really part of my development here, and yet I want to read one management book a month, and I want to do these things. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's a room for that as well. But what we're talking about here in this form is those very specific goals that are agreed on in, an indiv in a leadership development program in an agency. Right. So ideally, if you're using the levels of leadership, which we hope you will, you'll identify whether there's a gap, needs improvement, adequate advancing skill and strength in those six areas of self-knowledge, coping with change, vision and mentoring, team building, and executive skills. We also at the partnership are you know, firmly committed as always to framing our work around our standards of excellence in the seven categories, which you see probably in very small type on your screen in the second grid, which are leadership, strategic planning, customer focus, performance management, fiscal and admin processes, and results. And there is no formal assessment for that in the kit. Our standards of excellence are, are available on our website and are widely disseminated through the network. But people need to decide if they need knowledge in some of those areas because these aren't just the partnerships categories. These are the standard areas of excellence uh, in industry. That's right. And for a leader who's especially looking at moving into an executive role at some point, you have to have capacity across all seven areas. Just as leaders need to develop their leadership gaps and become competent, if not expert, in all the areas of leadership, you need to develop competencies and excellence as well. So we ask folks to know where they are on this because it gives you a point in time assessment. And then when you evaluate the IDP, the individual development plan, the thing to do is to assess, has there been change there? Has there been movement? And to perhaps redo the levels of leadership a year into the process. Which is a great idea. Take a look at where that starts and ends. Mm -hmm. And then the second page of the IDP, which can be as many pages because obviously it's a spreadsheet and it will expand to take on anything you like. And I'm going to ask Sue to talk a little bit about these areas. So you're starting out with the, the goals, um, and then what are the competencies that are going to be required to be able to do that goal? And from there, what kind of steps do you need to take to be able to develop those competencies? You know, this is really getting down to the nitty gritty. The more specific you are, the more likely that there's going to be success. Also needing to think about what are the resources that are going to be needed. So if we're setting somebody, someone up to be able to do some fancy schmancy something and there aren't any funds to be able to do that, that's, they're just going to be set up. There could also be barriers that get in the way, you know, whether it be time barriers, whether it be availability barriers, it, you know, could be any a number of barriers, but really thinking about that because what you're doing is you want to set this person up to succeed. What you focus on becomes a reality, and that the, the um, goal research talks about more challenging kind of goals and specific, the more likely the person is to meet it and to be successful at what they're doing. Couldn't agree more. Now, when somebody is assessing, and we do recommend that you meet formally with in your program, at least quarterly, even if it's a short sort of a check-in meeting. Mm -hmm. But let's say things you're just getting a funny feeling. How do you know if something's kind of going wrong with this? How do you spot the challenges? With each person who has an individual development plan, you're going to have a, a mentor coach who's assigned to that person. And that person is going to expect that, you know, open communication, regular, ongoing feedback on what's going on. And when, you know, my thing is when I start to see people withdraw, and they're not maybe meeting a deadline, or they're avoiding me, or so it's just not right, then I start to say something's going on here. And rather than kind of wait and see what happens, you know, it, it's the time to start getting involved and to, to get an intervention. Um, that, you know, it could be a number, you know, personal issue, whatever. I think the key to it is when there's withdrawal or when they're not meeting the deadlines. And at that point, they start needing um, increased feedback. And they need to, you know, get, you need to get a sense of what's happening. Do you need to amend the action plan? And one of the things that we did, haven't really talked about, but is that this is all fluid. This changes all the time. And so we know things may change, and so you have to change with that, just like, you know, your strategic plan, anything. 
So this is fluid, and so if somebody is having difficulty, if the task is not a match to them after they've tried it, then you need to rethink that and, and come up with a different action plan <coughs> that will meet their um, needs and, and the organization's needs. Excellent. And you see some of the four areas. We're going to move on. I'm just going to ask if people have questions for us. We're scheduled to go until 3.15 in order to take those. We're going to keep going through the evaluation component because, as you can tell, neither one of us is very interested in leadership, so we've done a little, a little more discussion than we had planned for time. So we're going to let a few more questions come in, if you have them, and just continue on through this and spend a few minutes after this on evaluation and the slides that are for you to look at for thinking about next steps. Um, so go ahead and type those in. There's a question box. It should be in the lower right-hand side of your screen, and Cashin is monitoring those, and we'll read them to us. So how do you keep people from kind of going off the rails? I think that, as Lil, you talked about, at least quarterly, really taking a look at that. And we're going to evaluate the program on two levels. One of them is an individual level, and one of them is an agency. And so we're, you know, you're going to want to evaluate um, the, the, the number of um, employees that you have and high potential employees and how many are staying, how many um, have been, how many have stayed and how many have resigned. You want, you're going to keep track of that. But more importantly, you're going to really be looking at the uh, overall, your hires. So I, I look at this, this chart that you have in, in front of you and it talks about this year we hired 12 people and nine of those, or 75% were for external hires. That's concerning. I would say, well, wait a minute. Is our plan even working? We have this whole individual development plan, leadership development system, and, and I'm not sure that it's working. And this is a nice metric that the board can receive, the ED, so you can really monitor it. But it's critical to follow and see if your goals that you established early, which may be to minimize outside hiring, are being achieved. Mm -hmm. Really, how to get from here to there, um, and that's always Judy Chaffin, our no longer new, but director of the Office of Community Services, who, as most of you, if not all of you know, you know, came out of our network, and one of her favorite phrases is, the devil's always in the details. That's right. And how we get from here to there, aside from sounding a little bit like Dr. Seuss, um, is really think about this, if you can and if you will join us in this as continuous success rather than a one-time or even an annual process of succession planning. Sue? It's, I think about it as an agency initiative. It's really bringing your culture, changing your culture and moving your organization along to be able to meet the ever-changing needs as any business or organization needs to do. So rather than thinking about it in a short, you know, a small frame, it's a big long-term kind of project that evolves over time. Um, a last sort of word on how to get from here to there um, from us here at the partnership, if you will, is mostly right now, at least from what we're hearing from the field and certainly based on my agency experience and Sue's wide consulting experience, is that most of our agencies lack sufficient bench strength right now to fill their key positions if something happened on Tuesday. That's right. Most of us, however, have quite a bit of talent ready to step up to the plate in a year or three or five with adequate preparation. So we can sum up the goal really of what we're trying to do is going from that insufficient bench strength, and not meaning you don't have the right people, meaning they right. just aren't ready yet, right, to a pool of ready talent. And it's about recognizing people and development skills. It is truly about uh, valuing just as we work to develop the capacity of the individuals and communities that we serve. We count our success in community action by the changed lives that our services help people to create for themselves, to go from dependency to independence, to go from poverty to self-sufficiency. Mm -hmm. This is really no different for an agency right. going from a dependence on outside and external resources to a growing dependence on themselves and their own ability to generate their own new talent to come into those key leadership roles. And our final substantive slide for you uh, today, past these, this is a lot of work, we're going to go on to the last one, which is, is that success without succession is, in fact, on many levels a failure. 
Sue, you were talking about this earlier. Want to share your thoughts about the most successful agency in the world? You, you have the most successful agency, the, the executive director who has national awards, local awards, and leaves after a stellar career. And there's nobody to fill that position and to, to take on. And suddenly that agency is, is floundering. So there was great success, but no succession. And so now we have a failing, uh, uh, flailing agency. So success with succession is success. Mm -hmm. The best of all possible worlds. And that's not to say, and we'll address this in the executive toolkit, that you shouldn't be advertising outside your agency. You should be doing all Absolutely. the appropriate right. human resource functions that you would always do when you look to fill positions permanently, which is that those who are ready internally compete on an equal basis with those who are perhaps interested from outside. Mm -hmm. They win the positions, um, you know, fair and square, as the old right. saying goes, which is a benefit. One, it's, of course, legal, fair, and, you know, inequitable, so it's right. appropriate. But secondarily, there's no question about whether they were, in fact, the right person for the position. Right. They have the certainty of having been vetted and chosen. It's simple. If you go back to our cartoon at the beginning, anointment as a successor right. without any kind of process can really derail their future success. There's always the possibility for backbiting, and I could have had that job, or I heard they didn't even bother to advertise for that job. And whether or not they're the right person, that handicaps people. Right. So we're not suggesting that this in any way, shape, or form becomes your only method of bringing people forward. What it does is increase that bench, increase that talent strength. It increases your interim success as an agency because everybody's able to do more. Mm -hmm. And you bring people along and you create a culture of bringing others along internally as well as doing it in the community. So with that, we're going to pause for a moment and ask Cashin to read us some of the questions um, that have come in. We have at least a couple, I know. If you still have some, we have a few more minutes, so please feel free to type them in. Um, we're going to go ahead and put up our uh, slide with how to contact us, our email, and that we'll be posting the finished kit in the next week. It'll be available free to every community action agency, and we stand ready to help you with implementation questions um, and how you would look at this going forward. So, Cashin? Well, to start us off, what is the relationship between a non-trusting culture and the use of 360 assessments for leaders, and how would that be handled? Ah. So, in a non-trusting culture using that, well, I think, first of all, there is the anonymity factor. Right. Um, um, for that. But I think that's a larger question than just how to do it. Sue, your first thoughts on that? Well, I think that um, it, it's almost... You know, you're not going to know who who did the evaluation, but it's going to be um, feedback at, that will be helpful to the person. And that by having that all out, you start to, I think, the more transparent, and again, this is anonymous, but it's still the feedback is there, the more transparent you become, hopefully the more trusting the organization becomes. And that transparency is sometimes hard to get from, from here to there right? if it's not part of it. But it is not just best practice, which right. it is, but it's also there's a generational shift going on. And right. Sue and I both do training pieces on generations at work. And there is an openness that younger leaders in particular right. expect more than traditionalists and even some baby boomers. Um, in their workplace, and it's become a cultural openness. Look at all right. of our, you know, all of our media. So I think it is not just an agency issue, but I think it's also an issue of our time right. that, that becomes um, involved there, which is of course larger. I think the short answer to your question is is that you need to have enough 360 reviewers generating those right. um, charts that it's clear that there weren't just two or three people in that case. You'd, you'd want to have more, um, and the. Remember, too, these tools are intended for use for those who want to develop right. as leaders. They're not intended for use to evaluate, say, an ED's current performance right. as, as a leader. Absolutely. Could you use them that way? Yes, but we don't recommend it. Um, so you're looking at people who want feedback, who have committed to making individual change. Right. So I hope that addresses your question, uh, whoever sent that in. If not, please feel free to type a follow-up. Next question. All right. Uh, next we have, what happens to Polylog when you choose Billy for a leadership role, and how would you handle her uh, agency role after that? 
Ah, so if they were peers, for for instance, for a, a position coming open. Right. And you have a highly self-confident person who assumes they're going to have it. Right. And yet you have a better leader who is a better fit for the position. Right. So I think that's with any any time you do that, I mean, that there's a fair and objective um, process, as Lil talked about going through, mm -hmm. um, for the hiring. And that um, you're, you know, maybe part of Pollywog's feedback, and it probably would be, is, how how to deal with that if she didn't get that? How to work with that? I mean, that's a real disappointment to her. And and part of your goals already with her are to say, you know, you're seeing yourself differently than other people are seeing you. And so, you know, this person was in a position that was ready to go. And and here's what you can do. Here's right. some concrete steps that you can do to perhaps address right. some of those gaps. Right. And strengthen the areas because you'll note, looking back at Polywog's chart, by the way that Pollywog had some pretty good skills, even by her rate of right. assessment. They just simply weren't where she thought they were. That's right. So you've got you've got some perception challenges. But I think, again, and it's transparency in education. Right. And instead of just saying, well, Billy Boy got the job and that's all you're going to hear about, right. it, somebody needs to take that initiative and say, and here's why, and here's what you can do about it. Right. And we'd like to see you try again the next time something similar comes up. Because you want to pair it with that encouragement right. that this is not the end of the road. because. Oftentimes, and, and I know that certainly millennials and even Gen Xers are prone to this, want that instant advancement right. when they're not perhaps ready right. yet. And I know that's a, a common frustration we see with boomers right. managing those other generations. Right. So, there, But there's a lot of support that can be given at the right. same time as you're saying, no, perhaps not yet. You know, in one agency I was at, um, somebody did not get a position that they had applied for and were very disappointed. And so they really looked at what were the skills that were missing. Um, why didn't they get that position? And then we're able to help develop some of those to get that person ready the next time around. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think it's, you know, as, as um, transparent as you can be and, you know, and this is just, I think, common practice. This isn't, you know, specific to leadership development. It's just any time you have these situations, you want to give people the feedback and help them to figure out how to grow and develop so that they're ready the next time. Because that's your goal and their goal. A couple of other questions it looks like have come in. We do. Uh, what suggestions would you share with a community action board on what benefits we have to make available to key people participating in this? How do we motivate them to greater responsibility? Ah, a good question. And I think one that, that I'm pleased came up because we touched on it, but we didn't really delve right. into it. Um, speaking from, uh, frankly, some of my own experience uh -huh. in watching people, a lot of times people just want a chance to do more and shine right. so that right. the, the opportunity itself becomes a reinforcer. Right. But that's hard to articulate uh, for boards, and a lot of times people think it's about money. Right. And realistically, it's seldom about money. Mm -hmm. uh, so what other things would you add to that? Um, I think that, but it could be. Mm -hmm. you know, it can be. You know, and again, I think some of that is generational, mm -hmm. but it could be that there is, you know, somebody gets a bonus for being willing to put in the extra time and, and to go ahead and do that. But most often it is, it's, it's getting feedback and praise and just that opportunity to grow and develop and continual feedback. So the board acknowledging and thanking goes a whole, whole long way. Um, to just you're doing your job and the board member walks down the hall to go to the board meeting. So I think that there can be a lot of um, acknowledgement is key, and it could be some financial pieces. Mm -hmm. It could be some tuition reimbursement. I mean, right now our times are really, really tight with that, so that might not be an option, but those could be considerations. Additional flexibility sometimes. Yes, yeah, not that's all. That's a great idea. Depending if, if, if they're in positions that can, if you support flex time arrangements, yes. offering that. Offering those stretch assignments with the recognition that comes with them. Yeah. Sometimes they grow to the point um, as a leader that they've really outgrown their current role, and yet you need that role. You know, you can look sometimes at looking at the position right. itself, and perhaps there's a title change, mm -hmm. or perhaps there's um, getting to go to a conference that someone's going to go to, and mm -hmm. preference is given to those who are up to date and following through on their individual development plan. Mm -hmm. I'm just trying to think off the cuff of things that have been offered to either me or other people I've worked right. with, you know, that have meant a lot to us. Right. And it, we, it would all really come back to acknowledgement, acknowledgement in some way, shape, or form. It does indeed. And so re I think that that's a huge piece to remember, that people want to be 
They want to perceive that the people behind them in this organization and the board are supporting them and believe in them. You know, sometimes just being told you did a terrific job on this right. assignment, you clearly have a really wonderful future in this kind right. of work. Sometimes that is uh, right. that is all we need. Right. Speaking as an emerging right. writer. Kevin, do we have a final question? We do. Uh, we were asked to spend a moment with the levels of leadership diagram. We kind of flash through that really quickly, what the different areas are and how they fit together. Certainly. If you can take us back to that slide, we'd be very pleased. We have about three minutes left. Um, one of our dicta is that we start and end on time. So let's talk about those six areas of the levels of leadership assessment. Why don't you take us through uh, one more slide, if you would, Cashin? And let's go to the one that people can actually read because I don't know that I can read the one with the colors myself here. So um, I can, I'll go through it briefly, but in your toolkit, there's going to be each of the different um, steps, each of the different areas. It's going to talk about the questions in them. It's going to talk about if somebody scored low in an area, what they could do to further develop themselves um, to, to bring them up to, to speed. So. The first is self-knowledge. You know, how aware are they of themselves and how they um, are in the workplace, those kind of things. Coping with change. We know that in this environment, it's constantly changing. If you have somebody who can't change on a dime, you know, we're going to look at that. Vision. You know, a lot of leadership is about bringing people along with you and having a vision and, and people see where they're going and they feel part of that. Uh, mentoring. You know, can you work with people? Can you, you know, mentoring is different, again, than coaching, which is more kind of job specific, but can you help people to grow and develop and feel, take the risks to be able to do that? Team building is looking at, you know, bringing everybody together. You know, do, do, is this a team that works together? We saw that Billy Boy's team was great, um, but they, they were really able to work together. And then the executive skills we added for this specific toolkit that really gets down to, you know, the budgeting, the staffing, the, uh, you know, able to manage your resources, those kind of things. So the first five are much more kind of interpersonal mm -hmm. areas, whereas the, the last one is more the business, we call it, the executive skills, what you need to do if, um, from, you know, that kind of uh, perspective. That nuts and bolts area. Nuts and bolts. Which That's if it. you can't do that, you don't have a program right. to be coaching, mentoring, and developing That's or right. coping with. The only change you'll be coping right. with is having a program going right. away. Um, I think to add just a little bit to that, these are areas that are key to people developing themselves yeah. going forward. Right. Um, particularly that ability to cope with change. Right. Um, it's often been said that change is the only constant in the right. universe. And lately we've seen in community action it seems like well more than our fair share of that. Right. Um, what we're trying to do by rolling out this kit to you, and we talked to a number of people in the network before we did it after last year's national survey told us that leadership development was a key area of interest for the, I think, 40% of agencies that answered our national needs assessment. It was a, the highest ranked need along with succession planning across the board. Hmm. So this is our answer to that expressed need. Um, and together with Sue and David, have really actually very much enjoyed putting this kit That's together fun. and test marketing it in the last six weeks uh, around the network, making a few more changes based mm -hmm. on feedback because we are able to cope with change. Right. We are able to focus the future and we like input and we like right. to incorporate it and know that our tools are the most useful they can be for you. Right. We want these to be direct and practical. So our time is just ending. Sue, I want to thank you so much for coming down to D.C. today to be with us as we formally launch this and for all of your expertise and passion about leadership as we've moved this forward. Any last words for our audience? No, I thank you for the opportunity to be able to do this. And I think that for all of you, I mean, this is great work. You're doing good work. This is just such a fun opportunity to move to a different level that, you know, personally, as an organization, and the network that's, you know, in an ever-changing need now. So we need strength. So have fun and, um, you know, good luck. Enjoy. This, is, this will be available uh, for replaying. We encourage you to use it with your staff. We encourage you to use um, parts of it for your board training. We're going to be doing more of these, hopefully with the uh, non-sketchy video feed um, at the same time, but doing these in a conversational and discussion mm -hmm. format. So please, as you uh, answer the survey question that pops up when you log out, 
please do give us your feedback about what Great. you think about this and moving forward, because we do pay attention and we really value your thoughts. Thanks again for taking time out to join us. We know that the only thing you have less of than money is time, and we mm -hmm. appreciate the gift of yours. Goodbye. Bye.